Hello, it's Tommy from Pocket Clinician and today I'm talking to you about thermal burns. This is off of the back of a comment of one of our TikTok videos. Someone asked us to do a video on burns. Uh, I was going to do a generic one on burns, but it would have been a hell of a long video. So we're going to split them up. So this one is on thermal burns. Uh, we will do ones on electrical and chemical burns as well. So types of burns. So we've got electrical, so things like uh, open cable wires um, that are active. If you go to a building site, for example, you might see uh, these kind of patients uh, sustain electrical burns. Things like lightning, you get struck by lightning, fairly unlikely, but never know, it can still happen. And uh, stun guns from the police, um, we, we see that fairly often as well. Um, you can sustain electrical burns through that. So uh, chemical burns, things like liquid acid, and this is also on the rise. We're seeing uh, more and more acid attacks, um, sort of random as well, which is a, sh a big shame. Uh, but it's just something that we need to be aware of. So you can get chemical burns from acid, battery acid as well, and even things like cleaning products. Um, so yeah, just be aware of those. And then lastly, um, thermal. So sunburn, um, isn't that lovely? Can't wish we were all just suntanning on the beach somewhere. Um, but make sure you apply that sun cream because you might sustain a thermal burn. Um, things like the kettle boiling um, with steam or even the liquid and um, not using oven mitts on the gloves. I've seen a couple of patients that have forgotten to do that. So we're talking about thermal burns today and uh, there will be future videos on electrical and chemical, so don't worry. Now, um, another thing I thought I'd uh, mention is um, all of these situations, even in someone's kitchen, or like I said before, with an electrical burn, um, you might be going to some dangerous scenes. So always think about your safety and always just make sure that you're putting measurements in place um, to ensure that you and your crewmate and you know anyone else there um, are safe. And if that means calling the fire brigade or the police to, to help you with that, then so be it. You know, that's, that's what we're all there for when we work together um, as a team. So the assessment. Now, what you can do is use Wallace's rules of nine to assess the severity of a burn. And what this does is um, they've split up the different areas in the body and given them percentages because what we like to work out in a burn is uh, how, how much of a percentage is burnt. Um, so the head and neck is 9%, the upper limbs are 9%, the trunk is 36%, and genitalia is 1%, so I'm not really sure why it's called rule of nines, but um, anyway, it seems to work, doesn't it? So um, this is good, but um, it is difficult to estimate these on patients who have a larger belly, um, or patients with larger breasts as well, because then it's going to increase their body surface area, and therefore um, the percentage that is that is burnt, so you're going to have to alter the percentage slightly for that. There's a lot of numbers to remember as well. Um, if there's a, if you're in a high acuity situation, someone's got large burns um, and you're trying to work all these numbers out in your head, it might be a bit difficult to do. Um, but it is a simple and a credible way of determining uh, the severity of the burns. So the next one that you can use is the London Browder chart. So it's similar to the rule of nines, um, but they've split the body up um, even more. So it's not just an upper limb, they've split the limbs into two parts um, and even the feet as well into a third part. So um, this is good, but again, you know, patients with um, larger breasts or larger um, abdomen, um, you're going to need to add a couple of percent on for those. Um, and again, the numbers, there's lots of numbers to remember for a high acuity situation. I suggest just having a picture um, in your pocket or something like that that you can just whip out. Um, and, and refer to in front of the patient when you're trying to work it out. And um, the good thing is about it is that it considers age, where the uh, Wallace's rules of nine, it doesn't. So um, so yeah, you can look at AA on the head, B's on the upper thighs, C's on the, on the lower legs, and um, depending on their age, it will give you a different percentage, which is good. So whether you use the Wallace rule of nine, or whether you use the London Browder chart, they are both good. So you know yeah you we can both we can all argue that one might be better than the other or whatever um, but they're both credible they're both official ways of ruling uh, of assessing the severity of burns which is good um when you're documenting this or handing over to a doctor um you don't have to get the exact percentage uh, you know there's no need to get a ruler out and start working how long is their torso to how long is the burn and, and working that out 
um, just a rough estimate. So it's if it's about half of their trunk, then uh, you know you can say oh about seven percent or something like that. It doesn't really matter. And um, the other important factor cons to consider is um, don't worry about working out how much of a percentage is superficial or partial thickness or full thickness uh, we're just generally when you're working out this percentage it's just partial thickness and full thickness burns that you're going to worry about but even then i still wouldn't sort of try to differentiate what percentages of what types of burn and, and things like that so let's move on to the management now i knew that i was going to do a video on this and i had to right in here about the primary survey because it's something that we will all need to do especially in a burns patient i'm not going to walk through the whole primary survey because it's something that we all know about um, but i'll say a little bit about the airway now if there's airway burns then you you're going to need to ensure that the airway is clear and patent now the best way of doing this is intubation now there's a lot of paramedics out there that can't intubate um, i would consider um, call in for a specialist resource who can um, but if you can't um, then needle cricothyroidotomy is um, is fine um, the reason for that is if you've got an inhalation burn then the airways are going to swell and it's just going to completely close and then you're going to find it impossible to get to get an airway so as early as possible try and establish a patent airway um, unless obviously the patient is conscious then you know then you're not going to be intubating them but um, a doctor or an advanced paramedic might come along and uh, RSI them um, for, for that intubation. So then what you're going to do next is uh, remove the patient from the source. So if they are in a building site, you're going to remove them away from that. If they are in a kitchen that's really hot, remove them away from that. And then you're going to pour or irrigate the burn uh, with water, running water, for a maximum of 20 minutes. So if it means chucking them in the shower, if it means running their arm under a, under a tap in the kitchen, so be it. But yeah, water is best for a maximum of 20 minutes. What I would say is don't use ice or ice water because that can um, make the burn worse, basically. So yeah, just cool running water. Um, then you're going to remove burnt clothing um, because if it's hot, it's going to make the burn worse and also it can cause things like infections um, but if the clothing as is stuck to the skin um, then then don't um, don't worry about trying to remove that either cut around it or, or just leave it um, then you're going to remove any jewelry that might constrict the area so if they've got a, um, a burn on their arm for example you're going to remove anything distal to that so bracelets uh, watches rings anything like that um, if they've got chest um, chest burns or torso burns just take off their necklace things like that and it's also just to, to keep them safe as well so we do um, have um, burn gel that we can utilize on ambulances obviously there isn't taps on the back of ambulances um, so yeah burn gel can be used but water or saline is preferred generally if there's a house fire and the fire brigade has been called then um, you can utilize those to use their water um, to, to sort of irrigate that burn for, for up to 20 minutes. So then um, once you've irrigated the burn, you've removed all the, of the clothing and the jewelry, you've taken the patient away from the source, um, you're going to cover it in cling film. Um, now what you're gonna do is use small sheets of cling film and you're gonna apply it in layers, all right? Don't wrap it around the limb because otherwise it will swell and it will compress the inside of the limb and all of the blood vessels and then you can cause um, like a, a, well, an ischemic limb really. So what you're gonna do is um, you're gonna apply cling film over the top like this and you're not gonna wrap it around the limb, if that makes sense. You're then going to elevate the burn area if you can um, and that just reduces all of the edema that is produced um, when, when someone burns themselves. So um, there's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, I've seen people apply burn gel directly on the skin and then cover it with cling film. That's fine, um, that's okay, but I was always taught and it, and it does make sense and when I've done it in practice um, it does seem to be better. Um, if you apply burn gel over the cling film um, it's easier to apply and sort of generally spread over the area. It's less painful for the patient and um, also it doesn't get really messy for when the team at the hospital want to take the cling film off to assess the burn. 
Um, and don't use creams, ointments, wet gauze or non-adherent dressings um, because that can uh, irritate the skin, cause infections and, and it doesn't really do much for the, um, for the burn either. And butter, don't put butter on the burn. I'm sure, I'm sure you all know that. So um, what the patient needs is fluid resuscitation if they're wheezy and um, analgesia. So with fluid resuscitation, if you've got patients that have large burns and that's 10% in children using you know, the rule of nines or the London Browder chart, 10% um, in children or 15% in adults, they're gonna require IV fluids and you can refer to JL Calc for the dosages of that. And um, another point to, to make is don't um, get IV access in a limb that's burnt. Um, try to obtain it in the uh, unaffected limb if it's possible. So if the patient is wheezing, um, which might be a uh, which might happen if especially if they've got some inhalation burns, um, then you can administer nebulized salbutamol for that. Again, refer to the jail calc for the dosages. And um, the patient will probably be in pain, so um, definitely consider some pain relief um, where, where you can. And paracetamol works pretty well. So um, we've covered the assessment and the management of burns. Now, um, what I'm going to talk about now is uh, what do you need to do and when do you need to do it in terms of managing the, the, the plan or the disposition of, of the patient, right? So... If the patient has any of the following, airway burns, history of hot air inhalation, respiratory distress, circumferential burns, circumferential burns are burns that go all the way around a limb, significant facial burns, burns that are more than 15% in adults and more than 10% in children, again, using the Wallace's Nines or the uh, London Browder uh, chart, or if there's an occurrence of any other major injuries, you are going to be uh, taking that patient to the nearest appropriate hospital under a time critical transfer. You're gonna correct their A and B problems if there's airway and breathing problems, and um, you're gonna pre-alert that hospital, okay? Now, if they have um, any of these, I appreciate this is quite a wordy slide, so sorry about that, but um, any full thickness burns, any deep dermal burns, more than 5% in adults, or any deep dermal injuries in children, any burns associated with non-accidental injury, burns that affect the face, the hands, the feet, the genitalia, the perineum, neck, axilla, which is the armpit, elbow or knee, any circumferential burns, if the patient has any comorbidities that affect wound healing, things like diabetes or um, any neuropathies in, in the limbs, um, any um, burns with any other significant injuries, burns associated with sepsis, so if they already seem like they've got an infection uh, from the burn, and anyone with social issues, so um, if their house is burnt down, or um, they're wheelchair bound, or they're house bound, or something like that, or if they've got con uh, pain that you can't control, um, then tr all of these patients will go to the ED, okay? So you can't really leave any of these people at home. So, um, in terms of documentation, what do we need to write? So, you're gonna make sure that you write how the patient was burnt. So, did they, wasn't, was they not wearing oven mitts? Or did they, uh, was they sort of fimbling around with some uh, live cables and accidentally got burnt? Um, how, what time it occurred? And also, how long was the patient exposed to the source? Was it seconds? Were they in the sun for two hours, etc.? Um, the temperature, which might be difficult to uh, to estimate, but just a, just an estimation if you're not sure. Um, and it's also important to document if there was any first aid undertaken prior to your arrival. So had uh, the patient's relative run their limb or run them in the shower for 10 minutes before you got there. And then lastly, uh, you're going to be writing uh, what time and uh, what dose you gave in, in any medication or infusion that you gave. So I put these two pictures in here. Now, um, most, I think all, should have um, a major trauma decision tool. And it's just a chart that, um, that, that you, you can go through. And if the patient meets any of the criteria, then you can bypass the closest A&E and go to a major trauma centre, unless the closest A&E is a major trauma centre. Um, and there's, there's also some um, local guidelines that your trust might have in terms of burns. Um, most don't have policies in place where you can take them straight to a burns unit. Um, generally, 
they have to bypass a, an A and E um, before that transfer is then arranged. Okay. Um, so yeah, that pretty much sums up thermal burns. I hope you enjoyed that and learned something there. You can head over to our website, www.pocketclinician.co.uk, grab yourself a student paramedic book. Um, there is a little bit about burns in there as well. And, um, if you've got any feedback or any questions, you can Instagram and TikTok us at uh, pocket clinician, or you can email us with the email down there, but I hope you enjoyed that and have a wonderful rest of your day.